This is part two of our symposium with Kingsley Dennis. Dennis, Ph.D., is a well-traveled explorer, both inwardly and outwardly. He is a sociologist, author, researcher, futurist, and poet. He holds an M.A. distinction in globalization, identity, and technology, and has a doctorate in sociology, and his research was on complexity theory and how it could be applied to new information communication. Kingsley is the author of numerous articles on complexity theory, social technologies, new media communications, and conscious evolution. Kingsley examines evolutionary cycles as well as our systemic period of upheaval and change from such diverse fields as climate, economics, politics, quantum physics, and sociology. He speaks of our current epochal shift where humanity has the potential for an energetic upgrade, an evolutionary leap. He collaborates with the new paradigm, Giordano Bruno Global Shift University, is a co-initiator of the World Shift Movement and co-founder of World Shift International. Kingsley is the author of After the Car, 2009, New Consciousness for a New World, 2011, New Revolutions for a Small Planet, 2012, The Struggle for Your Mind, Conscious Evolution and the Battle Control How We Think, and recently Breaking the Spell, 2013. He is the author with Irvin Laszlo of The New Science and Spirituality Reader, 2012, and just released Dawn of the Akashic Age, 2013. Kingsley has also recently published a book of his poetry, Beautiful Traitor. Kingsley says, I continue to research, write, travel, grow my own vegetables, and keep on seeking to understand life's mysteries. After all, it's only a matter of perspective. Kingsley's website is www.kingsleydennis.com You've written a new book called Breaking the Spell. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about it, and especially what is the spell we are under? Well, Susan, the spell we are under is a form of social conditioning. And this may refer back to what we talked about early in the the technical mindset, in that Humanity has always, to some degree, been socially managed. Whether we go back to the earlier day, the earliest days, for example, of, of priesthoods, where information was kept by the priests and only disseminated in mystery schools, and uh, the masses more or less kept uninformed. And then, later on, for example, in in the days of the monarchy, social control was used to be a public display whereby uh, someone who wanted to went against the status quo would be put in stocks in the village square or even hung sometimes in the village square and that was a warning to people to stay you know to stay with the status quo and these days our social control is very subtle and carefully managed we can call it propaganda in fact, the, the godfather of propaganda, Edward Bernays, was the nephew of Freud and knew a great deal about the, the element of the people's subconscious and how to directly target this. And sociologists have done tests, and the famous one was called Obedience to Authority by Stanley Milgram. And that test was whereby actors would put on white lab coats and look official and tell uh, test subjects to 
electrocute people for giving the wrong answers. And 99% of the, of the test people would continue to electrocute people almost until death just because someone in a white coat told them to. This is a famous experiment um, called obedience to authority. So a lot of the spell is about um, social conditioning. And social conditioning is also not only physical and social management, but a conditioning to ourselves. We have a almost a, a veil over our true selves, and we are distracted by the world around us. So a main part of the spell is what I call um, our attention distractor. And so I say that we're not living in 2013 AD, Anno Domini, it's 2013 attention distractor AD. Because we have, you know, you know, I have to try and get the point across some way, that seemed a, a suitable way. We have this, this circus of media and uh, entertainment, entertainment which I also refer, I call it militainment, because it's so close to the old uh, warfare simulation games with its violence and that. We're living in an age of militainment military slash entertainment. And so this distracts us. This distracts us from working on ourselves as well. And so the world outside is very strictly formulated. It's out there. It's in certain parameters. It's within a box. And in the book Breaking the Spell, I referred that to our ancestors uh, a, long, a long time back. We had a different consciousness where the world outside and the world inside was more blurry, almost like a child's consciousness. In the, in the early years of a, of a baby, the, the world is a blur of the inner world and the outer world. And slowly, through the formative years, the young child or the baby, gradually through, obviously, conditioning with, with the parents and the family environment, constructs um, an exterior world which starts to become permanent. And then we lose our our imaginary world um, and our imaginary friends, and we start to then project ourselves into a very solid box-like exterior world. So breaking the spell is about stepping back from these exterior distractions, trying to first realize that we have layers of social conditioning, because unless or until we realize that we have layers of social conditioning, we can't work on those layers. As they say, you know, no one will, will break out of a prison until they see the prison bars. Um, and so there's a wonderful story that comes from, I picked it up when I was traveling in, in Turkey, and I think it goes back to a story from Gijif, uh, a, a, a philosopher from the... Uh, end of the 19th century and up to the first part of the 20th century. And his story was that a, a magician was also a shepherd. Magician shepherd had a huge flock of sheep, but he had a problem because the sheep kept wandering off. They went where they wanted to go. They wouldn't come back at night and he couldn't control them. So the magician shepherd had an idea. He decided that he would hypnotize his sheep. And he would make the sheep think that they were humans. And that if they lived in his field and didn't wander off and did they had a life that he wished them and, and told them to have, that you know, they would go, they would have a happy life, and after they died, they would go to a wonderful paradise and would have no problems. And after that, the, the shepherd never had a problem with his sheep again. So that story in some ways is an analogy that we have been hypnotized by modern life and that that has distanced us from our connection with our energetic selves or with our sense of self. So I refer to working on oneself as polishing the bridge to oneself. And the bridge, the bridge to our inner self is, is like a, a muscle that if we don't exercise the muscle, it, it doesn't perform very well. But once we start to exercise the muscle, it grows and becomes more functional. 
And that bridge, by polishing it, by nurturing it, by connecting with ourselves, starts to increase access to ourselves. And at the latter part of the book, I also talk about some exercises that we can participate in. Uh, one is called uh, managing our energy, the other is stepping away, and the third is being vigilant. And these are exercises that make us be more aware of our energy, how we use it, how we give it away to people, or choose not to give it away, as may be the case, because modern life and sometimes modern people do sap our energy. And the exercises of stepping away and being vigilant also refer to how we can maintain inner states of calm, try to be objective in a distracted world, try to step out of a lot of um, events that pull us in and um, really just distract us from a, a sense of inner awareness. So that, in a nutshell, um, Susan, is what the book Breaking the Spell is about. And I finished the book with two short essays about the misconceptions of spirituality in a modern life. And uh, it's, it's a very short read. And that, that was my main focus. Well, I found it extremely helpful. And I also thought that, that my, you might have been influenced by some Buddhist traditions and thought there. But also, what I found quite helpful is you talked about positive inactivity. I wonder if you could speak about that just briefly. Sure. Um, it, it may seem like I was influenced by Buddhist thought in, in terms of the mindfulness and the inner peace. Um, and I spent several years in Turkey, for example, five years in Turkey. I had uh, contact with Sufi teachings, for example, and I'm aware of the teachings. That, so um, I was not projecting any one teaching, but it's very likely that certain understandings, um, because in a sense, a lot of these teachings are part of a perennial philosophy. That is, a, a, a the, the central core of many teachings are the same, in essence. And I think that when, when we have been in contact with a lot of the essences of these teachings, then when we project them, they do. We can say, ah, I can see a connection to this or that from there. Uh, so coming from that, inactivity is because our, one of the conditionings is that we feel that if we're not active, or rather inactivity is, um, let's say, a negative trait. One has to act to respond to something. Mm. Um, and I would say, well, that may not be the case. The first response we should have is, how should I react to this? What type of reaction does it need? Because sometimes a, an event, an encounter or a happening, rec the best response is inactivity. Yes. And, you know, and that can put a positive energy in, into, the, into the encounter. For example, if we've had an encounter with someone who maybe has been angry with us or is projecting something onto us, and the, the immediate response may be to, to react against that, to deny it or to, to bring up fault or something. We may decide that, in fact, the best thing to do is not to play into that particular strategy or that gameplay. The other person may need to work it out in their own terms. And the, the worst thing we can do is to throw energy back at them. So an inactivity non-response could be the most positive thing in that situation. Um, so that's just one small uh, example. So I try to say you know, we should consider how to respond first, not just necessarily think that a, an active response is the only response. Well, that seems to me to tie in what you were saying earlier about having a more feminine uh, perspective because normally activity or doing or um, the urge to shift energy by our own will is seen as yang or masculine, where inactivity and allowing seems to me to reflect feminine values. I can also see how this ties in with what you were suggesting might be a more 
appropriate response when you spoke with Sibel about the Boston Marathon to not react, to just let be and uh, see where it takes us. Is Am I thinking in the right way? Yes, indeed, Sue, no, that, that's, that's very perceptive. And uh, although I didn't talk specifically about the spending values, they they can definitely be associated with that type of response. And again, it ties into the response of the the new C values we talked about. Consciousness, mm. communication, compassion. And also we can put them together and we can talk about conscious communication. Yeah. Because communication does not necessarily mean conscious communication. <laughs> yeah? And, yes. and so yeah. And so um so to, to respond with a, an appropriate consciousness and also to tie in what we talked about with the new sciences is that if we are aware that we are non-locally connected, we may realize that responding in the old mindset of conflict, in fact, is only going to be damaging for ourselves mm. because we are sharing the same energy field. So with these new understandings, it may shift also how we perceive and wish to respond and behave in our everyday lives and hopefully that will be, be a, a stimulus for bringing on board the, the new set of values or different set of values which are more conducive to coherence, harmony and equilibrium. So, Absolutely and if I may I'd just like to mention you because you mentioned Edward Bernays and Adam Curtis did a fabulous documentary called Century of the Self that really gets into the heart of what you were saying about what he did. And especially in the U.S., it gives a very clear indication of how much of an influence he had um, on the culture. So I'd like to encourage people to listen, to find that on YouTube and listen to it as well. Mm-hmm. So I thank you for that. Good point, Susan. Yeah, Adam Curtis also uh, more recently made the uh, three three series documentary called "The Power of Nightmares," where he talked about how a lot of modern authorities deliberately deliberately create fear as a response to events to again as a, as a form of social control. And that would tie into what we discuss in terms of reaction to events such as Boston Marathon 9-11. So thank you for bringing Adam Curtis up. A very good reference for people. Fabulous. I think Sibel has a question for you now. Hi, Kingsley. Hi, Sibel. Um, I had a question. It seems like we've gotten value kind of mixed up, like economic value and actual value. So we, we discount things that don't make a profit, like... Mm-hmm the ozone layer or beauty or nature, you know, those kinds of things. How can we, you know, refactor nature into our culture and refactor things that have value but may not have profitable economic value? That's an excellent point, Sibyl. Um, the way we use value as an economic status, we, we refer to people in, in terms of their worth. What are you worth, their status? And th- this type of uh, mindset has now been projected onto the environment as well. When we when we think about something, we often say, is it viable? Is it economically viable to do this? It's often our first response. And now our countries talk about the country's status and well-being in terms of GDP. <laughs> it's almost as if we're living in a topsy-turvy, upside-down world. We've got things the wrong way around. And now it's interesting that I think it's the, the country of Bhutan has, has instigated the, the um, well-being index and is was the first country to uh, refer to itself not in terms of economic GDP, but in terms of its country's well-being and the well-being of its citizens. That would reflect its true worth. And also the United Nations brought on a well well-being index and is trying to promote that. And so this has been taken up by um, the also the financial, let's say, uh, commentator Hazel Henderson, who talks very well in terms of green economics and a new economy. And she talks about um, a well-being index, 
and not GDP. So th this, this idea is, is now gaining some ground. And what, what we have to do is really shift our sense of valuing everything and valuing people's worth and also from a political policy term uh, point of view to think about our future and our present well-being in terms of happiness and more humane values and well-being in terms of also the state of our environment, the state of our natural ecological systems, because unless, unless we can make this shift, we are going to find it very difficult to shift towards this planetary society that I've been discussing. And so we are in this value system that we have of economic value is part of the growth syndrome. Our economics is based on a mindset or a syndrome of permanent growth. Our economists have to keep growing in order to have a healthy global financial economy and healthy systems. Our energy extraction has to keep on growing. The CEOs are pressurizing companies to have increased profit. Everything is based around increased growth. Now, hey folks, we live on a finite planet. What, at some point, we cannot have continued economic growth because it just is not, it's not viable. It's not going to happen. And I feel that we're seeing this now. Um, we, we are seeing this in terms of our resources, our energy and our economics. And that's part of the disruption is because the model of value is not a sustainable model. It's, it's not a, a harmonious, ecological, coherent model. And we have to shift not only economically, but in terms of political policy to seeing well-being and happiness as part of these values and part of our indices also, and not, not this GDP only. So. Yeah, I actually even saw an article recently that some of the people were dropping out of the workforce because the the workforce is, is insane. It's stressful and not humane, and for their mental well-being is part of why they were dropping out of the workforce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so just priority shifting – because you know, if, if we go off of you know, advertising or anything else, it's the only way to be happy is to have more and more and more and more. But you know, endless growth equals cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. the idea of enough just isn't there. That's it. It's it's a, a completely crazy mindset. This idea of plentitude and growth and consumerism, and. You, you're exactly right. This, this is a time, this transition period, where people um, are both thinking and considering about their priorities and also being forced to reconsider their priorities. And this is part of the spring cleaning that I, I referred to earlier, is that it's a time now to reconsider our lives, our priorities, and to ask ourselves, where do we truly wish to see ourselves in 10 years' time? And, and to consider what are my priorities, what are priorities for my well-being and health, and what can I do to start moving towards these, these priorities, these intentions. And I, I've had a lot of friends personally who have been going through these life changes. And it's not surprising to me because I think this is what happens in transitional moments, in times of, of catalytical triggers. And I had the same the same moment myself, I made a change to leave a, a structured career in academia. I basically just packed my bags and, and jumped ship. And I, I, for my own personal journey, is that I arrived in Andalusia with two bags. One bag was a 15 kilogram bag of clothes. I say 15 kilograms because I know exactly because the airline won't accept any more. <laughs> and I arrived, you may know which airline I'm talking about, and I arrived with a small uh, laptop uh, in my hand luggage and a few books. And that was f um, four years ago. I haven't looked back since and I've written about five books since. I, n I now have my own garden, I plant and grow all my own food. 
I work in the garden. I went through a very, very large learning curve because I've never even worked or planted anything in a garden in my life. Um, my parents made a joke. That they thought I was going to learn everything from YouTube, how to garden. <laughs> and I turned around and I told them, well, I don't have to use YouTube. I just look over the garden fence and, and copy my neighbor. <laughs> um, so I went through my own learning curve. I went through a financial restructuring, a lifestyle restructuring, because I came to a point in my, in my life where I thought, well, I could go on where I'm going. I could make a very good career doing what I'm doing. But my heart's not in it. And I just don't have the instinct for this. I feel like now's the time to change. If I don't make it now, it, I may never make it, or it may be harder to make it down the road. And so I decided to make the change. And that, for me, was part of this transition period of reshifting my priorities. And from my personal experience, I, I feel a lot happier. Uh, I feel a lot harmonious. Um, I'm richer in myself, which which is my index of value. <laughs> so. That's a wonderful story. It's very inspiring. And I, I can hear in your voice, you have a good life, you know, and it doesn't get better than that. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. And it's a true story as well. <laughs> <laughs> Kingsley, listening to your very touching yet familiar story about making massive life changes. I think that um, some of the obstacles that allow people to uh, making those changes are a sense of fear, disempowerment, and uh, subjection to outer authority. And you had mentioned the power of nightmares as speaking of this. But I wonder if you could tell us how you see that these might be interrelated. Mm -hmm. Fear, disempowerment, it's, and authority. Yes, it's well. The, the system, the system has a let's say I, the system has a very functional way of being. Is that it brings people in, in a way almost like a kind of straitjacket. And the more we struggle, the more it seems to tighten. And so, and also it gives that the feeling that we have too much to lose. So mm -hmm. the, sen the sense of disempowerment is that I can't leave this, this way of being or this system because I will lose everything. That's the fear. Yeah. That's what disempowers people. And it weakens their energy, their motivation. And so we have to recognize that some people are genuinely caught up in the system, maybe through a, a debt accumulation because of the, the, the crazy economic system of, of lending, lending money at a, at, a, at a rate which was just not viable for, for the borrower or the lender and should never have taken place at all, to people who, who were not in a situation where they should have been given that much money by the banks, but the banks wanted to tie people into a debt system, whether through loans or mortgages or credit cards. And now, of course, um, it's, it's more difficult for people to walk away from this because legally they can't. So that is a situation where I would say to people, if you genuinely want to make a change in your life, sit down with yourself, with your family, if you are with a family, and seriously look at your finances and work out a plan over the years of how you can move away from this and work it out. It may be long-term plan, but you know priorities start to change now and can obviously bring an effect down the years. Um, the, other, the other part is, as you say, it's just a fear of letting go. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a, a, the fear of letting go reminds me of a, a story, a little tale I heard. And the tale is that a man is hanging off the cliff with one hand and his grip is loosening. So finally he decides to, to reach out to to the God above in this time of desperation. So he he reaches up, he, he points up with his eyes and he says, God, God, I hadn't asked I hadn't asked upon you before, but now is my time of need. I have faith in you now. God, tell me what to do. Help me. And then after a short pause, 
a loud voice booms out and says, let go. <laughs> and then there's a pause and a person shouts back, um, yes, but is there another God up there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, that's so true. But the, the, fear, the fear of letting go, Susan, is often disempowering. That, that has to be yeah. tackled from a, um, a psychological point of view as well. But even that story you told, um, he was giving away his power to a higher authority and looking for this higher authority uh, God. And that particular God didn't suit him, so he was asking for another higher, higher authority, another God, to give him an answer to help him feel empowered. It seems so crazy to me that we look to that rather than finding it within ourselves and listening to that still small voice within that uh, really has a vibration of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and that's, that's part of um, really our social conditioning, as we've talked about, to give out, to be in obedience to authority or to an external, external authority. And mm. that, that, that's the... Perhaps the, the most significant um, debilitating thing that we can do is give away our authority to someone else or to something else. And yeah. um, the, the, um, the, the German psychologist Eric Fromm had a wonderful phrase for this. He called it the fear of freedom. Yeah. And I think that's what some of us have, the fear of freedom to trust ourselves and this is one of the changes that I, I sense is going to come about over the years ahead, is that we, through this energetic change, vibrational change, and world change, is that they, they will be a rise of an instinctual intelligence. And I feel that people will start to trust and listen to themselves gradually more. Um, it, may, it may materialize or emerge more in the younger generation, but I feel that we need to and we will have to listen and trust ourselves more because that voice actually we have within us, uh, it may be small now, but it's incredibly wise. We just have to give it the, the credit it's due. Mm, yeah. Do you think that sometimes we hesitate because we're, we fear we'll lose our sense of belonging as well? belonging to a group mm -hmm. or to a tribe, to being politically correct? There are many belongings, yes, that, are, that we may fear being losing out. Belonging could be um, we don't wish those around us or, like I say, our neighbours to look strangely at us. We, the, human, the human being has a strong need for attention and recognition. Um, we, need, we, we like to be verified, we like to be acknowledged, and we know this in, in, in social pressure. You know, the, one of the, one of, for example, in earlier tribes, to be ignored or, as we say, sent to commentary, um, yes. to, be, to be ostracized was itself a community punishment. Um, that itself had fear, so in some people, I sense that they are fearing talk, even talking about these things. Because, in, because people may think that um, they're talking strangely or weird and they don't want to be thought of as being different. They want to be in, in part of the group. Um, the Chinese have an expression for this, is that the nail that stands out tallest gets hammered down the hardest. Mm -hmm. um, so no one wants to stand out or, or you know, be, be apart from the crowd. Um, yeah. So this, this is part of the fear. But again... That understanding of identity is very much a an, an material sense of identity, personality, which, which is externalized and it's very separate. It's me and the world and I have to fit into the world. Whereby if we, if we embrace the consciousness that we are part of a unified non-local collective, then this, this exterior sense of fitting in or not fitting in it is old paradigm, it's part of an old mind, and doesn't doesn't have a doesn't have a, a role there. So again, we come back to a person's perception and understanding of consciousness, which is behind 
the projection of personality. Yes, very much so. Um, and I was thinking in terms of belonging. We do belong with each other, but not just human to human. I think I think we're getting there, figuring that out. But also our local environment, and as we spoke earlier, the Earth and the cosmos, and that we're all evolving. And I wondered if you could speak about this a bit. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I I I. Spoken of this and written of this in the context of uh, a living universe, and, and as have many others. And if this is this is a sense of the more genuine belonging, is that we're mm. not yeah, we're not just this this species on the earth um, hurtling through a hurtling through space on on the back of a inert rock, you know. Um, that that for me is that for me is just that's a conspiracy, I think. You know, people may think the living universe is a conspiracy. I think living on the back of an inert rock, hurtling through uh, a non non conscious universe, is a conspiracy. Um, for me, the, the living universe is is the the genuine reality, and so that understanding of consciousness on a universal, galactic, solar, and terrestrial level. That means that we are all cycles within cycles. We are all intrinsically connected. And so I, 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 you know, I, almost, I almost get a sense that the, the solar system is looking down on Earth and saying, look, humanity, you've got to get your act together. You can't go around letting off nuclear weapons and you know, emitting radiation into my atmosphere. You're messing with me. So we belong to many... Uh, systems which we should be, we should refer to it as families, not not systems. Perhaps we refer we belong to a terrestrial family, a, a nature ecological family, a solar family, a galactic family, a universal family, and beyond that, a unity. And so, therefore, that belonging does entail that we play our part with the right sort of ethics and behaviour. And, and sense of responsibility and participation and interaction. So I talk about needing to needing to to embrace the living universe conception and consciousness as being being quite important, being very important, being primary. Once the living universe becomes part of our paradigm, then that hopefully will start to shift this understanding of, of belonging. Um, so, in terms of, of the sense of belonging, this relates to understanding the living universe concept. That not only do we belong with greater systems, but we should and need to refer to those systems as families in themselves. So we have we have a natural family, ecological family, terrestrial family. We also have a larger solar galactic, cosmic, and universal family, and of course the unified family. So if we understand ourselves as playing a participatory role within a living universe, and that we don't have this hubris role as being the, the great the great sapien sapiens all-knowing species who are in control, no, we are ecologically entwined with all the other systems and families. And just as we are impacted by the other larger families, so we impact them. And just as we would not wish to hurt our physical human family, so we should not wish to hurt the larger natural families, ecological, terrestrial families as well. So once we start to um, have the consciousness that we are belonging to these larger families, then I feel that this will, will shift how we behave and hopefully how we have a sense of belonging. No one is alone. We have to understand that we may be, uh, we may be um, physically alone, but, n- but no one actually is, uh, let's say, alone in the emotional connectivity sense. 
and that belonging, we have a belonging to the larger families. Yes, and so beautifully said. Thank you, Kingsley. Very touching. What you were just talking about sounds as if we're living in a mental plane, for the most part. We're that we've we've cut off from that awareness of that connectedness, and we we live in a private world, and could that might be symbolized by the Western male necktie cut off from our hearts and bodies. Mm -hmm. Take off our ties. What would that be like? <laughs> a good image, Tripa. Um, we are we are cut off, and perhaps one of the causes of that is how we've been using our minds to interpret the world. And we touched upon earlier the 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 Cartesian. I think, therefore, I am. And for for centuries, we've been existing through a left brain uh, consciousness or, or mental plane. I think mental plane is an apt way of describing it rather than consciousness because consciousness uh, has an all-embracing aspect. The mental plane has been very linear, rational. And so we've interpreted the world that way and therefore we interpret uh, how we respond to the world and also our personalities. Now, it's, it's interesting to note that a lot of the traditions, teaching traditions, what we may call wisdom traditions, use such practices or rituals such as chanting, meditation, or meditation in a, in a colored environment, such right. as a, a church using stained glass windows to have certain colors. We have zikas or mantras. Um, and these, in fact, and also we have um, such as the Zen, the Zen stories, uh, Sufi stories. These are mechanisms to activate the right side of our brain, mm -hmm. to try to not only activate the right side of the brain, but to connect it and bring it online with the left side of the brain. So they, our brains are in a collective relationship. And that apparently is, is helps our evolutionary growth and our growth to understand the world and to develop our perception of the world. And I would, I would refer listeners to the work of Robert Ornstein. Robert Ornstein, who, as well as being a neuroscientist, uh, created the, an institute called ISHK, I -S -H -K, which is the Institute for the Study of Human Knowledge. And he's been involved in, in certain wisdom traditions, and he picks up upon how the left-right brain is part of this um, way forward to integrate our understanding, to pull us away from the mental plane. Yeah. And so that has some background. Um, and also, if we look at, the, um, for example, the work of Jean Gebse, a philosopher, has talked about that we are moving towards an epoch of integral consciousness. And so he talked about the mental consciousness or the mental plane as being a prior or current state. And I, I think that has a lot of validity that we, we, are, we are moving towards what we could call an intent, integral consciousness epoch or era, which perhaps would have um, a correlation with a left-right brain, more harmonious working, which could, how that come about, I'm not sure. Maybe the energies we've talked about will help to facilitate the left-right brain correlation. I don't know, Japan. Well, it seems that a lot of that can be worked on. I mean, the the yoga uh, aspect of it is that you you get to dealing with your system as if it was not a part of all of this, and it's no, I, I you don't you don't, you no need to go any further. I totally agree. Yoga as a discipline, also meditative practices, um, what we could generally call work on oneself, whether it's a, a certain path that we choose to follow or a certain teaching, we or whether we choose to be in states of mindfulness or sit down quietly for a few minutes every day and uh, try to bring balance within ourselves. All of this, I feel, are, are, are tools to help um, bring into harmony our, our body as a receptive apparatus of, of, of consciousness, 
our, our brain to left and right side to work together. I mean, I, I'm sure that these traditions knew that was the reason why these mechanisms were, were created. You know, right. what prayer, for example, prayer, chanting, mantras, these are not for nothing. They're, now we, we're, we are realizing the science behind it. And perhaps the science is, is bringing this, this the in, integral whole human together to shift away from the mental plane. I can only agree with that. I mean, that, that sounds wonderful. And that, that sounds that we're becoming human. <laughs> you know, we, we differentiated us from the rest of this and called us a human being. And maybe we're just becoming human now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, funny you should use those words, um, human being and human becoming. I have referred to the human being exactly as that, human be- becoming. Would you expand I, on that? Sure. Um, because I, I see that, well, my understanding is that the human species is not a finished product. That just as we have transition in the world, we have transition and change and development within, within the human species. Now, some people talk about the next level of species is going to be some robotic android or some technological silicon. Transhuman, yeah. Transhuman, yeah, the transhumanist, the, the singularity um, people, the, these films like um, the, I forgot the name, the Schwarzenegger films, trans... Um, <laughs> <laughs> my Terminator. Mind. Terminator. Terminator. Yes. Um, this, this type of picture is of this this cyborgian future, right. and this this is seen as a natural development. Well, I would say the next next stage we're going through is internal development, and that it could have a physiological change on the human nervous system. But instead of having the focus on bring, bringing bringing on board these this silicon model as the next model that in fact we are not finished as a human carbon-based conscious vehicle on this planet and i was the the indian philosopher sri aurobindo Mm -hmm. also referred to the human as a transitional being and I, i i would agree with that i would say we are transitional being and our responsibility is to participate in this process so not only do we have evolution on a grander scale or planetary evolution, we have the possibility of self-evolution and also of conscious evolution. Mm-hmm. Now, why also why I talk about this moment in history as being so unprecedented is that we are now aware that hum- humanity as a conscious species can start to participate in their own conscious evolution and be a part of this evolutionary development. As far as I'm aware, humanity, according to our recorded history, has never been at that state of awareness before. Not so, in mass, right. There's been yeah, a few individuals that get there. Exactly. There's been some conscious mutants or change agents that have, have, have been there. Just as, as um, uh, Richard Book talked about in Cosmic Consciousness, that the these people these change agents are popping up more and more now. And I agree with that. I feel that we are going to a stage where this phenomenon is going to start spreading en masse. Oh, and yeah. more, more people are going to be aware of that and partaking of this conscious evolution. The, the analogy I use is of a blotting paper. I don't know if you're aware of blotting paper when you drop the inks and the ink spread. Right. Well, if you have a, a white blotting paper, you put one drop of black ink or any color, sorry, of ink on that blotting paper, all you have is a drop of ink. If you put a second drop, you have another drop. If you put three or four, what you have is a few dots on a white paper. But if you have enough of those dots on that paper and they all start to spread and connect together, you have that aha moment and before you know it, the blotting paper had completely changed to a different color. Yeah. That's exponential. Yeah. So I feel that consciousness has this effect. And as individually, now that's a question some people will say, what can I do individually? I can't change the world. Well, my response would be, 
Start by working on yourself. If you can work on yourself, work on your conscious thoughts and your own conscious evolution, that is helping to change the world. Yes. Because that is being part of the dots on the blotting paper. You're, you're adding one more to help the color change on the blotting paper. So we are not ineffectual. Every time we think or work or can't be conscious, we are being part of the change. Um, that's, my, that's my understanding. And it acts non-locally as well. It mm. seems. Yeah. I mean, it, it it gets in the air. <laughs> that's right, and that that's more that's more grist to our argument, so to speak, by having a non-local science to back up, saying, "Well, don't be frustrated. Uh, you may not see the results immediately." You know, we're in this kind of supply keep and practicing. demand culture. Yeah, we, supply and demand. Keep, you know, we we're so used to ordering something and getting next day delivery. Right. Well, you know. Self-evolution doesn't work on next day delivery, I'm very sorry. Um, it does deliver, but not, not in the way that you may think. <laughs> um, it does make a difference. Then. Yes, thank you so much for that, Kingsley. Sabelle? Okay, thank you. I had a question about um, where our focus goes. You know, the, the past, the now, or the future. You know, sometimes when people are talking about the past, they say, you know, you don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. But mm -hmm. I, I sometimes wonder now, is the past, can we learn from the past? Are we in such a new place that the past, we need to just let go of it? Of, of course, I, I do feel we can learn from the past. My focus, however, is on the present. Mm -hmm. um, and again, of course, if we're talking about a new consciousness, then that uh, presence of consciousness is in the, is in the current now. And so... I, I get a sense that the past was, was an area where perhaps more of our older generation, our parents, would, would, would um, linger in, think back on. Because, again, talking about this, these moments of, of rapid change as opposed to static change, if we talk to our parents or an old generation, and, for example, who lived through the Second World War or, or the central, the earlier part of the 20th century, they would say, well... Not much changed in my life. You know, I, I grew up and lived all my life in the same house or the same neighborhood. Not much went on. They weren't so much aware of the change. And so the past was something that they could look back on and, and uh, connect with and, and feel some kind of resonance with. Well, now, we at this moment in time, and especially for the younger generation, they're moving and we are moving through rapid change. And so... The past seems more, more and more disconnected because it seems connected to an old mind or old paradigm, which is no longer what we want to connect with anymore. So I would say more focus on the present. Be, be aware of the future, not live in the future. Because again, the future is very hard to predict. And if, you, if we work on models by saying, I want this to be the future, then we're, we're creating what we're already creating labels or a box for ourselves or creating a vision. And, you know, humans can be quite stubborn. We can say, I have this future vision and that's the way it's going to be. Um, well, again, the future doesn't work that way. The most flexible way and the most way to, and the way to keep ourselves alert, I will say, is to be in the present moment and not to be too rigid with the way we, we, we think also and the way we focus, um, if that answers the question. Yeah, and I've seen sometimes uh, the idea of the future is I'll be happy when this or that. And, mm -hmm. and they're, they're missing the now. And the when may never come, and it, or it may not come that way or, or whatever. Yeah, so true. Uh, um, many people thought we'd be living in the land of the Jetsons by now. <laughs> the, that um, U.S. animation series, they portrayed the future in that kind of way. And we've had many future scenarios that by this time we would have colonies on the moon, uh, living off free energy by now, etc., etc. The future doesn't unfold the way we often think it does because what I, what I say is that the future is is in potential. 
Um, for example, I, I recently wrote a, an, an essay I put on my website, and I called it Future Potentials. That the future is in potential according to our consciousness and our happenings now in the present. Nothing's fixed. So we, sh we can be mindful of the future, but because it's in potential, like now if you use the analogy or metaphor of quantum physics, everything, everything is, is um, in potential until we, we collapse the wave. And so the present is the importance of focusing on now, being happy now, working, on what, working towards what is going to be needed and, and be functional. And that will collapse into certain future potentials. So that, uh, that makes sense to me, but there's also the, the concept of creating, attracting a new future. So in the now, how much of that intention should go to be creating and attracting a new future? Well, aren't we all creating a future in, in the present? Um, I thought that's part of the present, is creating the future. We are creating we are creating projects now, innovations. Everything we do is is for for to create um, what is to come to be better, hopefully. So, in a sense, the the future and the present aren't that distinguishable because we are creating the future in the present. What I try what I'm trying to say is is um, not to project in the future some definite place where we have this vision and this conception. And we become rigid through that. Uh, we we we'll create it by we we'll create the future in every present moment. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that feels very rich. Thank you, Kingsley. I know you're one of the co-founders of World Shift International. I wondered if you'd like to speak of that for a moment and tell our listeners about it. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, World Shift International. I co-founded with my colleague Nicolia Christie <clears throat> and that came through our through our involvement with Irvin Laszlo. Irvin Laszlo also, to my understanding, he, he uh, popularized the, the, the term world shift. Of course, no one can own the, that name, but he, he had the, he published the book World Shift 2012 and he formed some, some groups around that. And so Was the, uh, is the Budapest, is the Budapest Club part of that? Not part of the world shift, although it, it has ties to it, because obviously it was created by Irvin Laszlo also. Mm. But, okay. but the, yeah, the world shift, well, Irvin's world shift came through more similar to what we could call a, a, the latest projection of his ideas, similar to the global press. And so through uh, my, my involvement with Irvin, uh, my colleague and I, Wanted, thought that 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 concept, the world shift, um, it's just so powerful. World shift. You don't have to say anything else. It, it captures so much. Um, it, it's it's a kind of wow word. And so we decided that we we just wish to put out information and to catalyze people about the world shift. So not not to tell people what to do. Or we're not a large organization. There's only basically two or three of us behind it, and we're not um, overly active, we don't, we're not doing the events, or we're not, we don't get any funding. What we decided to do was, A, to create a website online to disseminate and put out information about the world shift in terms of an inner and an outer change or evolution. So it would try to talk about and, again, normalize this idea of inner and outer change. And also we created a social network. We call it the World Shift Now social network. Um, it, it can be connected to through the front page of World Shift International. If you go to World Shift International on the front page, there's a big box saying World Shift Now social network. And so far we have something like 200 or so members who come on and share ideas, talk, again share resources and videos, information. Um, so I, I don't wish it to take a lead role and do anything like, this is what you should be doing, this is the world shift. I take a step back and I wanted to create a platform with my, with my collaborator, co-founder, to allow other people to have a conversation. So 
we're not a great big organization. All we're doing is, A, we're trying to allow people to con connect with this information and get, and to get some information about the world shift, and B, to have a social net network platform to allow people to engage and have a conversation and to start to do something for themselves. Because, again, the world shift starts with the person, not with someone telling you what to do, but for each person having their own ideas and initiative. So um, that's what we are, really. Um, nothing grand, just, just that. Well, that sounds exactly what is happening. Conversations, being together, sharing information, being in relationship. It sounds wonderful. Kingsley, is there anything else you would like to say in closing? Well, I think we've covered a lot, and I'm, I'm greatly appreciative of all of your contributions, your wonderful questions, and importantly, very appreciative for everyone who's listening. Uh, my final comment would be that everything begins within ourselves. We have the power, the capacity to make change in the world and in ourselves. Never doubt Never doubt the energy and the power that each person has and the power for positivity and from lighting that match. So no matter how dark it may seem, the power of lighting that match is incredible and positivity and the energy of connectedness and conscious communication will help to take it where we need to be. And never doubt that. And thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Kingsley. It's been a wonderful experience, a wonderful conversation, and I know we've all enjoyed it, and um, we'd like to invite you to come back again because I feel like we've just touched the surface with you, and you very much are in harmony with what we're exploring consciously. So thank you, Kingsley, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, likewise, thank you to all of you. It's been a wonderful conversation. This is what it's all about, the connecting, the communicating, the, the shared understanding, the shared compassion, and the sharing with the listeners. So um, I'd be very happy to come back, and greetings to all of you from Andalusia and Spain. Thank you so much. That was really lovely, and I just really enjoyed our conversation. Likewise, I did. I can't believe that. Three hours have gone past. <laughs> Did you guys no, stop time? <laughs> Chipper has composed on the spot a poem. And Chipper? Well, thank you, Kingsley. I just wanted to say this has just been such a rush talking with you. I, 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 it was as if I was sitting across the table from you. What I wrote while we were talking about Bhutan, what is the currency of happiness worth today? How do we sit when life urges us to play? Do we hold on to the hard parts that don't defray the stumbles of a footing going splayed? Losing touch with edges where the verdant lay, rooting deeper into ground however that we may as we talk with one another during all our days? That's, that's a wonderful part, beautiful. Uh, great resonance as well. It comes across with great resonance. Oh, and, and thank you. You have, you have the perfect voice for it. Uh, please, please include that in the conversation. I think it, it's so, so important. Well, I wanted to uh, share with you your own poem uh, because it spoke so simply and deeply to me. There is a dance that lights the darkness between distant stars and embeds into deep, densest dark matter that threads its fiber into thin, translucent veils, lighting up also our helix conversation as acid chats to acid, photons speak with photons, shock impulses tug our hearts beatific through our brains until we light up in delight as if in our Tesla dance. Mm, that's, a, that's a memory blast. It, um, I say, it's, standing next to yours, yours sounds a lot smoother. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I've got words like photons and acid and and uh, shock in there. Yours was a lot more smooth, was smoother. <laughs> oh, I, I understand, and I get my shock terms going too sometimes. <laughs> yes. well, thank you for that. It was uh, good to be reminded of that, that old one. Perhaps this might be 
and exams, a few examples of new conversations that are about to emerge. Kingsley, would you tell us about your website and uh, any information you'd like to direct people to on, on your website? Thank you, Susan. Yes, I, I, my website is my name, kingsleydennis.com. You can just Google my name, Kingsley Dennis. Uh, luckily, there's not many of us out there, and <laughs> you can find it quite easily. I, I put a lot of material on the website. I, I have many articles free for downloading. I have articles in Spanish and French, and also I put out a newsletter every month, which I write an article for, and also I put out uh, news links and, and web links and video links. So um, that my web page is like my where I, where I exist on the web, and you can find out a lot more from me and what I've written about there. And please, I try to provide everything just for free to take so people can inform themselves. And I'd also like to mention you're on Facebook, which I find very handy because um, you link new things that come up for you. So I'd encourage people who are interested in your work to um, sign up for your Facebook page too. 